Great to see you here today. Um, we hope that you're here expecting to hear from God. Uh, he's here with us, and we're uh, going to celebrate His presence and be filled with His Spirit. And we're excited about you being here today, too. Let's stand together and praise the Lord. Greatest day is the Amen. You may be seated. Lord, have mercy. Almost a full church. All right. Great to see you all here this morning. I rolled out of bed this morning. I thought, oh, Lord, have mercy. There's going to be nobody here at church. But you guys pleasantly surprised me, and I'm so thrilled that you're here today. I want to let you know that uh, we're going to be meeting here at 5 o'clock. Uh, we're our planning uh, session uh, to look at our new five-year plan and to set our goals and to encourage uh, uh, our membership, and we need your input. Uh, we know that God has a future. 
We're just not sure where exactly that is, but that's what it is to be the people of God. But I'm fully convinced that John Wesley was right that as we conference together and pool our resources and our minds, we can decide how it is that God wants us to go forward. So um, I know this is a volunteer organization, but we'd love to see you, and I hope that you'll come. Uh, second announcement, uh, on the back table there is a little handout, and it has a convenient suitable for hanging on your refrigerator uh, schedule for all of our Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany services. So if you'll pick one of those up, um, chances are you won't show up at the parking lot and no one else will be here. If you do, chances are they're not all wrong and you're right, okay? Everybody's out of step but my John. So if you could remember that, we would appreciate it. And finally, Mary Banky has taken it upon herself to try and organize some young people to go to Resurrection this year. If you have a young person or know of a young person who would uh, like to go to Resurrection, if you'll contact Mary, I'm sure she'll be able to uh, put her in. We need to know pretty soon, though, because reservations have to be made, and as you know, uh, that fills up pretty quickly. So those are about all the announcements. Are there any of the announcements that need to come before the body? Excuse me? When is Resurrection? Uh, January... Let me think. January 21st through the 23rd, and it'll be at the LeConte Center in Pigeon Forge. So be a great weekend for the kids, I'm sure. Other announcements we need to make. Yes, ma'am. Great, thank you very much. So there are a number of ways we can help out that ecumenical project in town, and uh, I'm excited about being able to do that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, by way of prayer requests, we've got a big celebration. Uh, you see uh, on the far right uh, a refugee, oh, excuse me, no, a survivor. <laughs> a survivor from her procedure, and she's up and around and doing pretty well, and we're so thankful to God. I can do all my things I was here for. So, so no, and no more pain. So I, I'm really Amen, good. amen. I'm good. And as soon as the doctor releases you to do dishes? Yeah, I'll be here. Okay, I'll all right. Yeah, yeah. You can't do them yet, though. Yeah. Right, no. okay. Okay, sorry, Keith. You'll have to keep doing the dishes. That's the way it is. <laughs> we are thankful for that. Uh, continue to pray for those in our midst who are facing surgery and we have families who are mourning. We remember Stephanie and her family and the losses recently occurred in her family. And uh, continue to remember our nation and our world. Are there other prayer requests at this time? Okay, please. Josh for stepping in this morning and uh, helping out and always welcome to have these guys. So amen, thank you amen. for that. Yeah. And yeah. I also just wanted to mention that uh, the George Wythe cross country team girls won state yesterday. The boys were third I place, saw I believe. That. We have several here in our church and of course Coach Julia over there leading. You know, the I was aware of both of those, Keith, but I knew that there would be a parent or a grandparent who probably wanted to do that <laughs> announcement. So thank you for filling those in. Sure enough, sure enough. Now I've left my little skit sheet back here. I think it's time to stand up and is it time to do another song? Is that what we're doing? Oh, that's, I'm the one that's making the big bucks, really, yeah. Listen, you don't want another sermon, do you? <laughs> Let's stand together and we'll continue to praise God.
all here together today. Thank you that we can fellowship and worship together, and thank you for our St. Paul family. I pray that we will have a successful meeting this evening as we plan and figure out the future of our church, and I just pray that you will help us to remember all that we have to be thankful for during this season of um, life. We pray all this in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for coming. You know what I like best about this time of year? Families get together and we get to see people that we haven't seen in a long time. As a matter of fact, I brought a friend of mine to church who I haven't seen in over a year. But boy, I've sure spent some time with him the last couple of days. Would you like to meet him? He's right over here. Oh boy. <laughs> Have we been good friends. Who knows what this is? A rake. And what do you do with rakes? Rake up the leaves. And boy, have there been some leaves. Have you noticed? Every year, those big, beautiful trees that gave us so much shade all summer long start to drop their leaves. And some people just can't stand, like Terry, can't stand the leaves being down on the ground. And so she goes out and rakes them, right? No. I go out and rake the leaves. And I have to admit to you, even though I'm glad to see my old friend, I hate raking those leaves. I wonder why God does that. Why does God give us great, big, beautiful things all summer long, and then in the winter, all the leaves fall off, and those trees aren't very pretty, are they, the ones that were all pretty all during the summer? And you know what? In a couple of weeks, there's probably going to be covered in ice and snow. Oh, it's going to be terrible. Then I won't be able to rake. Thank you, dear. Yes, that's right. I'll remember that. I won't be able to rake. Amen. 
Well, that's the end of the children's sermon. There you go. That's, good. that's great. But you know, whenever I go out and rake leaves, a lot of people think they're beautiful and all that stuff, but I'm not very happy about leaves. I don't like raking them up, not because it's a lot of work, but because I think it's kind of sad. I look at all that pile of old dead leaves, and I kind of think about that beautiful tree all summer long, and now look at it. It looks dead. But you want to know the best part? Deep inside that tree, in, in the very inside, God has put a special ability that if I wait long enough, come spring, guess what's going to happen? All the leaves are going to come back, and that tree is going to be beautiful once again. I think God does that to remind us that even when things go bad in our life and it looks like everything is dried up and nothing's really happening, deep inside of us, Jesus lives. And because he lives, even though things might be going on on the outside, you just wait. God's promised that spring's going to come not only to the trees, but also to our yards and probably to my attitude, too. You know what? I'm going to be really glad to say goodbye to this friend. But I hope you enjoy all your friends each and every day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for even as the leaves fall and the darkness comes in the seasons, we know the spring of your love not only is coming, but dwells in each of us. And that gives us hope for each and every day. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, Terry made me promise that I wouldn't forget the basket. Do you know what this is for? I didn't even have to tell you to stand up or sit down. You guys have got it down pat. Good. Is that oh, too high for you, isn't it? Oh, she got one of my yellow ones. You get enough? What do you think? No, don't like the red one. Get another blue? All right. That's the one I'd have picked, too. <laughs> you are like an ocean. I've been playing on the shore. Now I'm diving in because I want to know you more. You are like a mountain. I've been camping at the base. Now I'm heading to the top I want to see your face I want more Give me more More of you Lord, I open my mind And my heart to receive All you give I want more Give me more More of you And may this holy quest Be my passion The reason I live I want more 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 never comprehend why you would desire to know me as a friend you've been waiting for me i've been wasting time now i'm running to you my arms are open wide i want more give me
Chapter 10, verses 11 through 25. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice to sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put in my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly, without wavering, to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, Hebrews is... um... (laughs) One of the challenging books in our New Testament uh, because it requires us to be really familiar with the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews is really um, an extended uh, teaching sermon, apparently, where the writer is taking um, the New Covenant and contrasting it and comparing it with the Old Covenant And at the bottom, showing Jesus to be the way of faith to be superior to the Old Covenant. Now, we have to be careful. The Word of God says that the Old Testament is eternal, God's promises to the Hebrew people. And yet, it is clear, at least in the mind of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer, that Jesus opened up totally new possibilities not available to the people in the Old Testament. I have to admit to you that um, uh, I'm addicted to the History Channel. Um, One of the things I love, especially our ancient civilizations, studying ancient civilizations, and through new technology, uh, archaeologists are now becoming aware of uh, civilizations that we really never knew about. I mean, when I went to high school, you know, the Aztecs were probably the oldest in Central America, but now because of new technology, we're finding that there were civilizations that existed, advanced civilizations that really know more about astronomy and mathematics thousands of years before we in the Western world ever knew about them. LIDAR is the technology, it stands for light uh, distancing and response and what they basically do is they shine this pul- this laser down into the ground and and they visually can peel away the jungles down in Central America in the rainforest and they have found 500 new cities that they never knew anything about because they've been shrouded up and they've only scratched the surface the tenth chapter of Hebrews is kind of like um, uh, a drone if you will It it allows us to fly over this whole saving work of Jesus Christ and see what it is that Jesus did for us. Now, careful. (laughs) You know, we Protestants are awful proud that we've got it all tied up. But this 10th chapter is remarkable because it shows salvation biblically And not necessarily what we're always aware of what Jesus accomplished. So let's fly the drone over, examine what the writer says, and then if the video was right, we want more. Let's see what more Jesus has for us. Are you with me? Okay. He starts out in this 10th chapter comparing 
Jesus' offering of himself with the Old Testament sacrifices. He says that the priest stood up day after day making the same sacrifices day after day and it never really forgave any sin. God held those sins in abeyance until the perfect sacrifice could be made and we believe that to be Jesus. Now, most of us agree with that as Protestants. We, we understand that Jesus died for our sins and our sins are forgiven. But then he goes on to say, after Jesus did that and he accomplished that, he now sits down at the right hand of God in heaven, the place of authority. He rules over the house of God. And if you read your book of Revelation, you'll find out that when we stand in judgment, it won't be God judging us, it'll be the one who saved us from our sins. Jesus, okay? Story complete, right? Well, no, <laughs> not exactly. He goes on to say, make a, a connection between our salvation, our justification, with how we live our everyday life. That part of being saved is not just taking my name off the bad list and putting it on the good list. Rather, it's me living into what's already been accomplished for me. He, put, he says in the 14th verse, I shouldn't have closed my Bible. He says in the 14th verse that he waits, Jesus waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. In other words, Jesus is waiting for the end of time. You with me? Something yet has got to be accomplished. For by that one sacrifice, he forever made perfect those who were being made holy. Wait, wait a minute now. Perfect means complete. We've talked about that. So by that sacrifice, we have been made complete. God has done for us everything that God needs to do for us. But yet... We are being made perfect or uh, holy, sanctified, set apart for service. So God redeemed us because he has something in mind for us to do. And in order to do that, we've got to be sanctified. In the Old Testament and in, in, in kosher, in traditional Jewish homes now, they have a set of dishes they only use one time a year at Passover. Right? It has been set aside for this special purpose. That's what he's talking about. We have been made complete by the sacrifice of Jesus, but there's still work to be done, the work of sanctification. And he gives us the assurance that we can have confidence in that because our sins have been washed away and we no longer have to feel guilty. Psychologists tell us that they would lose anywhere from 60 to 85% of their business if they could find a cure for guilt. Now, I know none of us feel guilty about anything, right? Well, there's some things I'm not real happy about in my life. And I know in my head Jesus has forgiven me of that because I've asked for his forgiveness and I've repented. And some of my friends have forgiven me of that. My wife has forgiven me of that. You know the only one that refuses to forgive me of some of the stuff in my life? Me. But because of Jesus, I can march boldly into the throne room of God. Not arrogantly. That's what he's saying. He's not saying carelessly. But I can walk into that throne room because of the one who loved me. The story is told of a soldier who got word back, he was in the Civil War and he got back, noticed that, that his mother was dying and he wanted to go home and see her, but he went to his, his commanding officer and said, I need to go home, and the commanding officer said, I have no authority to send you home. He said, the only, matter of fact, the only way that you can get home to see your mother before she dies is if the President of the United States gives you permission. Well, he went AWOL. <laughs> he went AWOL, and he got all the way to Washington, D.C., and when he got up to the White House, he saw the guards standing outside, and he thought, well, I'm sunk. And he sat down on the curb, and this little boy came up to him. 
And the little boy said, sir, you look sorry, sorrowful, sad. What's going on? And he said, well, I had hoped to see the president, but these guards are not going to let me see the president. I'm just a soldier. And the little boy said, well, I'll get you in. You'll get me in. Well, he, he didn't think it was possible, but he figured, I've got to try. So the little boy got him up and dusted him off, and they walked through the front gates, and the guards waved to the little boy, and he went, holy mackerel, this is weird. And they walked up the front lawn, and the soldier was sure he was going to get shot, and they all waved to the little boy. That little boy walked right into the Oval Office of the White House, and President Lincoln looked up and said, hi, Tad, who's your friend? Tad Lincoln, President Lincoln's son. What I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, is in our own righteousness, we have no right to come into the glory of God, into the throne room of grace, but we don't have to fear anymore because our son has introduced us. Are you with me? That in itself is wonderful. But the writer of Hebrews says salvation goes even farther than that. Salvation is how we live our lives. And he says three things which on the surface may not seem all that important but they need to be characteristic of each of our lives and our church's lives. Number one, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. What is that hope? Well, the hope is that one day at the end of time, all the heartache, all the sorrow, all the defeat, all the anguish, all the injustice, and every challenge that you face in your life will be put away forever. Well, that's fine, preacher, but have you looked outside lately? <laughs> have you seen what's going on? We can have hope because the Bible says that the one who was promised is faithful. You may go be going through a dark time right now. Maybe the leaves on your trees all need to be raked. <laughs> maybe maybe the, your life looks like that old summer tree out there, all branches, and you can't see any hope. But deep inside you, my brothers and sisters, you see Jesus has invested in your life new life. And while you may be going through a dark time, I want you to know better days are coming. And because Jesus is alive, better days are coming for all of us. And we hang on to that hope. It's not hope like I hope the football team's going to do better this year. Some of your hope was misplaced, amen? <laughs> but when you put your hope in Jesus, you know that it's going to come true. And not only are we to do that, but let us think of every way to motivate one another to acts of love. I have to tell you, I love these new translations, but I sure like the old Bible better on this one. Let us provoke one another to good deeds. Provoke, call forth good deeds. Why should I be so interested in doing that? Well, because you see, Jesus did everything for me. And now, I don't have to live my life in fear because of the hope that lives within me. And that frees me to be able to live the way God wants me to live. What was the song that you just sang, Amazing Grace? And then they stuck that new chorus in it, right? My chains are gone, <laughs> right? I don't have to fear the Father's wrath anymore. He's on my side, but he's also on your side. Last week, I challenged you that love was the culmination of Christian faith. And that part of that is realizing that as much as God loves me, God loves everyone else. God loves you, and God loves you. And God loves the people in Washington, D.C., and God loves the people down at the Open Door Cafe. God loves the skid row bum on the street. He loves the drug act. He loves us all. And one of the primary ways that I show my love for God is the way I love my brothers and sisters. And that must be a characteristic of our life together. Now this last point, I wish I had an hour and a half to preach, but I don't. I'm aware of that. And 
I may not pay any attention to it, but I'm aware of it. Um, it's, well, it's like the preacher who went a little long one Sunday, and uh, he met with the church council after, and they said, Brother, you know, the two-hour sermon's getting a little long. I think we need to buy you a wristwatch. Or he, he says, I think you need to buy me a wristwatch, and they said, Brother, you need a calendar, right? So I won't faddle you with that. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. We have come through a horrible year and a half. It has taken a toll on all of us personally. And my brothers and sisters, it's taken a toll on our church. We have missed each other, and that is important. But God has set up the community of faith to be a community of faith. We need each other. I need you. And whether or not you like it, you need me. Can I worship God by myself? Yeah, you sure can. But I got news for you. It's a lot easier to keep the hope going when there's others worshiping. You may be surprised, but there are some Sundays I don't come to this church that fired up. Some Sundays I just as soon not be here. But you know what I found out? When I'm not here, I've missed something. And sometimes when I don't want to be here, it's the very Sunday I need to be here more than anything else because you see, your faith encourages my faith. And part of being a follower of Jesus is being in fellowship with other Christians. I'm not going to argue whether God's on the mountaintop or God's on the seashore. That's not the point. The point is that Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst. And as much as I love to see you, I love to be with him, and I love to be with his people. We all go through dark times. We all go through struggles and trials. But God has given us this fellowship. I know there are serious concerns, health concerns still around. But as we come out of this pandemic, let us continue to try and get back to the fellowship that we knew before because not only does it help us, but it honors God as well. And finally, he says this, especially now that the day of his returning is near. This was written a long time ago. And the day of his returning was near then. It's near now. Trouble is, God's calendar is a little bit broader than our calendar. And most of us don't have eternity to wait, but I promise to tell you this. God promises that we'll see his returning. Every one of us will see it, whether we're here, there, or in the air. He is coming back again. He has not forgotten us. Salvation, sozo, means to be made whole or made full, made complete. Be made what God wants us to be. Yes, God wants us to all go to heaven. No doubt about it. But just like Jesus is waiting for all of his enemies to put under his feet, we are in the time in between what we've already been given and what we've been promised. A promise is only as good as the person who made it. My brothers and sisters, you can count on God. He's never broke one promise to us. And I assure you, he won't break that again. So let us be saved. Let us be saved in the sense that our sins have been forgiven. But let us also be active in our being made holy. That is serviceable, usable to God. Because when we are who God created us to be, life takes on a whole new dimension. And we can live in faith. May God give us grace to not only be saved on a cross 2,000 years ago on a hill outside of Beth, uh, Jerusalem, but also saved in the essence that God's spirit is working within us and we're striving to become true disciples of who Jesus was. Behold, when you're in Christ, all things are new. Old things are passed away. May we live in the hope of that future and the realization of being who God wants us to be.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. John Wesley used to say that we should sing our hymns and our songs with the same gusto as we did when we used to be at the beer hall. So I know some of you don't relate, but for some of us that do, let's stand and sing with gusto. Well, Lon, I'll just add on to that. You just challenged us to be active in this last song. It's called Our Refuge, which sounds negative, but it's really a challenge to us all to refuse to be complacent and to refuse to be uh, passive. And so let's uh, think about that as we sing. Thank you, brother or sister. <laughs> I read one time that the preacher should drink deep from the wells of theology, but not drown his congregation in it. That's a lie from hell, and it smells like smoke. Part of our problem 
as a nation is we have become primarily enabled and encouraged to think economically. We have been vocal because we think politically. My friends, our vulnerable place, our Achilles heel, is we don't think theologically. And when we face crisis and turmoil, we think somehow God has deserted us. Oh, my brothers and sisters, God is faithful. He's not deserted any of us. Even if you're a long way from God, God is right there. Just turn. I can't promise you it'll all be well tomorrow. I can't promise you any of that. But this I can promise you. We'll never walk alone. He'll always be there with us. A little faith will get you to heaven. A little more faith will get heaven into you. May we seek to be heaven people in the world in which you live. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.